All right, what if I told you there was a tax policy with such diverse support that everyone from radical left-wing political parties in Europe to the late conser American conservative icon Milton Friedman supported it? What if I also told you this policy was not just some theoretical fantasy, but exists in the real world right now, and we have evidence of how it works? It seems crazy that no one would at least debate the merits of such a policy, right? We here at Three Cents thought so too. So this week I want to introduce you to the concept of the land value tax. Yes, a tax on land. Should we have one, and why the hell doesn't anyone talk about it? Here with me to help answer all those questions is Jesse Meyerson, a contributor to Rolling Stone magazine, and Brandon Fuller of the NYU Stern School's Institute of Urban Management. Uh, Jesse, I'll start with you. So what's the deal with the land value tax? Um, well, <laughs> speaking as like the radical left institute yes. invited on sitting here at the leftmost point of this Bringing couch. full communism to us on the red couch. <laughs> on the red couch. Yes. Uh, with my red mug here. Yeah. Um, I would say that for me the main appeal of a land value tax is that it takes a form of wealth that we have, landed wealth, which is um, like the, the majority of the biggest asset form in the, the most valuable asset form in the United States, which is to say real estate. And it, it takes that wealth and then it um, <laughs> expropriates it and devotes it to a public purpose, um, which is, and I think it's probably the most easy form of wealth for people to understand why that should be the case because nobody created it. It's, it's the provenance of God or nature and so um to have a small class of land-owning interests sort of sucking up all that wealth and extracting it from the economy doesn't seem to make any sense. Actually, philosophically, it seems bizarre and absurd to imagine that the earth can be owned exclusively by human beings. <laughs> and then in practice, actually, it, it comes out quite evil. Brandon, so th the usual argument against a tax is tax something and get less of it. You'll dis if you tax income, people will work less. If you tax consumption, they will spend less. Th the appeal of the land value tax, basically, is that you can't increase or decrease the amount of land, right? Right. Um, so you, you can't decrease the amount of land. So on, fish, on efficiency grounds, it does make a lot of sense, which is why folks like Milton Friedman were so supportive of the tax. Um, I think also we've, we've heard a lot about wealth inequality recently because of Thomas Piketty. An analysis of his data suggests that really what's driving capital out to output ratios in a country like the United States is mostly land and housing values. So we've seen this surge in wealth inequality in the United States that's coming mostly, mostly from land and housing. So the idea of taxing land is appealing for those who want to reduce wealth inequality in the United States. So do you see anybody doing that? Like, it seems like this ought to be a way for some municipality to raise tax revenue without hurting its economy. Has anyone had success with this? Um, well, I mean, I think there's examples in the United States and Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh and Scranton, for example, kind of break out. They have a two-tiered property tax in a way <clears throat> where they tax land at a higher rate than they do buildings. And I think they've been moderately successful with that. I mean, <clears throat> there are a number of issues in, in sort of real-world real implementation here. So one is that it's really hard to measure the value of unimproved land. So you'd probably want to do something less than 100% land value tax just to account for that margin of error, probably a lot less than 100%. I mean, the other issue is that it, it's not clear that it's entirely fair. I mean, there are a lot of people in the United States who uh, have moderate income or wealth. <clears throat> what savings they do have is tied up in the value of their home, which is partly a reflection of the value of the land that it sits on. So confiscating their wealth isn't necessarily going to be a tremendously popular proposition. You'd have to phase it in in a way that didn't harm those sorts of folks if you wanted popular appeal for this. So J Jesse, what do you make of that? Are you coming after these middle class homeowners in the suburbs? This is, I mean, you always see that with any kind of property tax, you say I'm gonna raise property tax, people, people freak out at you. How do you actually implement this in a way that, because you talk about this as going after oligarchs, but a lot of people own at least a little bit of land. I would say that the, the, the ideal implementation, at least in the first instance, would leave alone um, like owner occupied uh, properties and would just tax rents. It's just people who are elsewhere extracting rents from the land, who are um, sucking up land value that they themselves are not using. So that would be the most expensive real estate, which is to say urban real estate. This economist Michael Hudson, who I think is at New School now, assesses that the land value of New York City alone is greater than the total combined value of all of the means of production of the whole country. Every piece of productive plant and equipment in the whole country combined, not as, value as, the land, not as valuable as the land value of New York City. And by and large, that's not you know, middle class people who have their entire, you know, nest egg wrapped up in their house. It's like, you know, big landowning interests who are sucking in millions and millions of dollars of rent.
Brandon, what do you think? Is, is it possible to make that sort of distinction? Once you, I mean, you tax all the land, then you say, well, there's no economic distortion. If you're taxing only some of the land, then like, it seems like I mean, people will decide to be owner-occupiers if you do that, right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's possible. I mean, I, I think w when we're talking about cities in particular, and thinking about cities like New York City and, and San Francisco, another appeal of this proposal or another, um, another benefit that, that proponents often put out is that it will encourage additional housing development. Because if you're taxing land, for example, nobody's going to sit on a vacant urban lot. They're going to develop it. They're going to develop additional housing, which will put downward pressure on house prices and rents. That is an issue in my eyes. I mean, it, I don't think you're going to see that in a place like New York or San Francisco unless you also simultaneously relax land use restrictions that are way too excessive. In other words, if someone has an incentive to develop their property because the value of the land is being taxed, but they're unable to add any housing to that parcel of land because of local community board opposition or just zoning regulations, then they can add that housing, and you're not going to see uh, more affordable outcomes for renters and, and uh, uh, moderate income homeowners. Here, here in New York, Mayor Bill de Blasio, champion of the left, has, has put out a couple of small ideas that go in this direction. One, when he was running for mayor, he talked about this idea that we should have a tax just on vacant land. So you didn't want to tax the land underlying buildings, but when you have a lot, and you see a few of these around Manhattan, this really valuable land that for some reason has been sitting vacant in, in, in some cases for decades. He also, there's been talk about having sort of a, a, a luxury tax on pied a terre apartments. And in New York, you have all these super tall buildings going up in Midtown. Nobody knows who the buyers are. They seem to be Russian oligarchs parking their money here. Shell Corporation. Yeah, so you tax that and like it's, you know, it's not a pure land tax. You're taxing the land and the improvements, but a huge fraction of that value is the land. Do you, is, is this promising to you? Do you think that this is New York starting to move in, in, in this direction? Sure. I mean, basically, the, the more that you can uh, like take the, so the, who, who makes the land valuable is the question. And the answer to that seems to me to be partly the public, right? Parks, subways, these are the things that include increase land value and also the community, right? Shops, nightclubs, things that make people want to come to, and that's what makes the land desirable and that's what increases its value. And so that's who should be deriving the value. So anything that can take away from you know, a Russian oligarch who lives in the, the Times, what is it, the, the, the Time, Warner, Time Warner building on the, on the corner of, uh, of, uh, of Columbus Circle and, and distributes that to the people and the, the, the entities that broadly make the land valuable is, is good in my book. So it's good that it's moving in that direction. Uh, I would note that um, sort of hand in hand, especially in New York with something like a land value tax, to me is a congestion price. You know, where there's so many negative externalities to having all these cars in an extremely dense area, t smog, noise pollution, um, difficulty getting around on foot and that kind of thing. Um, so that sort of tax on land use would also be really valuable and you, you could conceivably fund uh, public transportation and lower uh, the train fares if you had a good congestion price. And Bill de Blasio, when he was in the city council, voted against Michael Bloomberg's proposal for it. Yeah, it was all these representatives from Brooklyn and Queens. The, you have these middle class households that own cars and it's like, well, you know, six times a year I'm going to drive into Manhattan. I don't want to pay the congestion charge. And public employees, a lot of whom get free parking at their jobs in New York City who otherwise would never drive a car into Manhattan every day of the week. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jesse Myerson and Brandon Fuller.